Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Sandy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Gardener Coordinator, and we are so glad you've decided to join us. Maybe you're dreaming of spring, I know I am. Well, we're here to help you out as you make plans for the season. Maybe you're trying to figure out what to plant. Maybe you had some problems last year and you wanna make sure they don't happen again. Well, we are here to help you. And we have an ever-changing cast of characters who are gardeners as well as professionals, and tonight is no different. And uh, Kent, what do you have for us? Hi, thanks, Sandy. Uh, my name is Kent Miles, and I am a owner of Illinois Willows. We are a specialty cut flower grower out in western Champaign County, and we do cut flowers, woody ornamentals, uh, and we wholesale to wholesale houses, and we also sell locally and ship flowers. Okay, uh, we have a question. Uh, it's one that I get quite often. Uh, what are five varieties of flowers that I can plant in the summer and bring them into my home? Um, so ones that I have thought of um, that are popular are Vizinias, Celosia, Sunflowers, Marigolds, and Asters. Uh, all of these are annuals and you can start sowing them in generally around Mother's Day is good or a little bit before, end of April. And they all make wonderful cut flowers and they all can be cut once and then cut later on for another uh, round of, of cutting. Um, you just want to make sure you remove all your foliage that would happen to be below the water line and uh, you're good to go. You know, just changing your water out every couple of days. Okay, and that would, okay very yeah. good. And it's nice, I, I don't know, I, I have such a hard time cutting flowers like mm -hmm. out of my regular garden. It's nice that they're thinking of it ahead of time. Just yeah. have an area where you know you're going to cut them and, you know, and those are really some good mm -hmm. selections too. So thanks very much, mm -hmm. Ken. And Candace. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Candace Hart. Uh, I am also an educator with U of I Extension here in Central Illinois. And I tend to focus on kind of home horticulture topics, annuals, perennials, a little bit of vegetables, that type of thing. Uh, anything related to home gardening. So my first question here is about peach tree uh, leaf curl, which is a pretty common um, disease of peaches. This uh, gentleman is wondering when is the best time to treat for leaf curl? after or before he prunes. So um, you could do either of those in this case. Um, the treatment for uh, peach tree leaf curl is a dormant oil uh, spray, essentially it's a dormant spray. So you can either do it in the fall, right after the leaves have dropped, or you can wait a little bit closer to spring, but making sure that you put it on before the bud starts to swell. Uh, if you apply this particular um, lime sulfur um, pesticide to actual green growth, you're going to cause some damage. So it, you need to put it on during the dormant season. And um, doing it after pruning is obviously actually not a bad idea um, because peach tree leaf curl overwinters on the twigs. So if you remove some twigs, you're also removing some of those spores and then give it that dormant spray and hopefully you'll be good. But very common disease in yeah, home orchards very in common. particular, and often because people don't think, you know, you have to do it ahead of time. Yeah, you see once it. you see it, it's too yeah. late to spray yeah. at that point, so you need to plan for the next okay. season to okay. take care of it. Very good. Something to put on our calendars. Make yep. sure you do. Okay. And Mike? Hi, my name is Mike Brunk. I'm the Urbana City Arborist. I'm a licensed landscape architect and a certified arborist. I oversee forestry. I oversee contractors for the landscape uh, portions of the city and uh, the Landscape Recycling Center. So I'm mostly involved with trees, but I certainly might be able to answer questions on recycling and some plant questions as well. And I have a question here about magnolia trees. And this is from Barbara. She has two saucer magnolias in her front yard, and one is having trouble. And it's about 27 years old, so they're fairly established. It had many blooms this spring, but we noticed the leaves are much smaller than the other tree and uh, much fewer, so it's thinner. So I looked at the picture that Barbara sent, and I was looking through it, and I was just kind of looking at the landscape as I could best tell in the uh, photo, and then I saw at the bottom of the photo this. So it's the strap that uh, looks like was put around the two multiple trunks there to hold them a vertical that's girdling that tree. Get that off the tree ASAP. Uh, if you can get it out of the tree, that's great, but it's girdling the tree and hopefully you can get that off. And uh, realize folks, when we do uh, uh, hold these kinds of uh, multi-trunk trees together like this, those straps have to be inspected regularly and generally you don't want to leave them in, on any more than the first season. 
Okay, very good. And you can see exactly why they did it because it looks like the tree's ready to like right. crack open mm -hmm. or something like that. So that may be one of those things where it's just really a structural problem. Overall could could for be the a tree. structural yeah. problem, or you may want to just let the tree, if, if it's a double trunk, yeah. let it naturally kind of lay out. Let it go. Let it be free. That's right. Okay, very good. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> and I just want to remind people we do have our podcast now. Hopefully, you enjoyed the first one. Diane Nolan did, and I learned all kinds of things about vegetables. Uh, and actually, Mike Brunk here did, has done the second one, and it is now available. So, what kind of things did you talk about on the podcast, Mike? Oh, shoot. We talked about walnut trees and sandboxes. We talked about uh, signs to tell about uh, if a tree's declining. We talked about structural integrity. Let's see, she even asked me what kind of tree I felt like being. So. <laughs> I can't wait to find the answer to that <laughs> one, what is the answer. And so make sure, you know, check out the podcast. So there's, um, we have some great ways that you can connect. Uh, either through iTunes or Stitcher or NPR One. Uh, certainly download them now from midamericangardener.org. And I think that's really going to be a fun thing with the podcast. I think you can learn a lot from those. So thank you all very much if you've had a chance to listen to those. And if you haven't, you're missing something. So check out the podcast now. And I think I'm going to do one here real soon. I'm not sure what she's going to ask me about the <laughs> fruit I like to be or something like that. I'm not sure. And also keep in mind, we have a voicemail now. So you can actually leave questions. You can call us at 217 three zero zero eight two two four and call us if you have a question either for the show here or for our podcast uh, we'll really help you out so lots of ways to connect with us and lots of ways to get some answers to your questions so hopefully you enjoy that so thank you all very much for doing that and we're going to go ahead and go to our lines and on line two we have joanne from springfield and you have some questions about tulips what can we do for you Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that our tulips are beginning to come up, and oh. they are in an area that we're going to grass in this spring. Uh, how do I move them? Can I move them before they bloom or after they bloom? Okay, move them tulips. Good question. I would wait uh, and not move them now because more than likely you're going to mess up your bloom. Um, if so, if you still want to bloom, want to bloom and enjoy that bloom, I would wait. Uh, and honestly, the best time to move a bulb is in the fall. Uh, but the bad part about that is that you have to remember where they are because the, the, leaves, the leaves are gone by that point. So your second best time would be after they flower. Let those leaves kind of age on the plant. Let it store up a lot of energy back in there. And then go ahead and dig those up and, and move those okay. is what I but would say. She really brought up a good point because I noticed even my daffodils are starting to come up. Yeah. And here we're expecting cold weather. So do people need to be worried about that as, you know, bulbs start to pop up? No. Not really. Yeah. Even if we get a little snow, that just... They're pretty Helps tough. It, yeah, it yeah. kind of gives them a blanket, you know, from the cold. Okay, so don't wor so don't worry too much. But mm -hmm. good question. Okay, thanks, Joanne. And on line three, we have Steve from Bloomington, and you have a question, Steve, about pruning trees. Uh, yeah, thank you for taking my call. Sure. Uh, I think this question might be directed more towards Mike, but uh, I'd like to hear all your opinions. But uh, I got to do some uh, tree trimming in my all the trees in my yard, and I was heard that uh, the industry has gotten away from applying pruning paint on trees and I was just wondering what uh, what you think so that's a really good question do you need to put pruning paint on after you yeah that is a good question pruning? generally not but you know we do use in special circumstances sealers uh, even orange shellac on certain trees that are prone to disease so oaks, for example, um, in neighborhoods or areas that have oak wilt or maybe even bacterial leaf scorch, uh, if you prune that tree during the insect season, so in the spring, summer, or fall, those insects are attracted to those fresh cuts and they can land on there and feed on it and then take that problem to another tree. So in those circumstances, uh, sealing that wound is a good idea. But generally speaking, we don't, we don't paint wounds anymore. Yeah, so that yeah. black paint yeah, <laughs> you can still buy it sometimes, which I, yeah. which is a little bit confusing sometimes. But you really don't need to use it. It tends to seal in moisture, right, and cause other things to grow on the wound pretty commonly. Yeah, so that's yeah. one thing you don't have to worry about. So very good. Okay, thanks. And on line two, we have Dan from Effingham, and you have a question about looks like maybe growing some grass under trees. Uh, yes, I've got a salt maples and some horn maples, and. Uh, I seed grass in the spring. I'll seed it in the fall. It comes up, grows great. But uh, within a, before, before, the, before winter comes, it's completely dead. Mm. How do I keep it alive? And I've tried all kinds of varieties of grass. Yeah, so that's a real comment, especially underneath maples. Mm. You know, right. get, trying to get 
grass to grow underneath maples. What do you think? It's possible it's just too dense of a shade. Uh, it's kind of what I'm what I'm yeah. thinking, unfortunately. It might be a good place for some mulch or <laughs> a, 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 a ground cover some, that would maybe yeah. tolerate. Um, some hostas some, or ferns. Yeah, if, yeah if, shade if tolerant. Yeah. To do that. All Rennials. grass needs mm -hmm. some sun. Yeah. Now, tall fescue, I've had some luck in shaded mm -hmm. areas with mm -hmm. the tall fescue. Mm -hmm. it's, some grasses are a little more tolerable of shade. Uh, Liriope might be a, uh, is a ground cover. Ground yeah. yeah. Grass-like mm -hmm. looking plants, a little coarser, uh, that might work better. So um, be careful uh, if you do plant live plants under your tree, you're gonna be very careful that you don't damage the root system. So plant very small plants, space them apart a great deal and let them grow together. So that's just a really good point. I know a lot of times people, especially with maple trees, people trying to grow grass underneath them, mm -hmm. but just to realize that there's a reason why there are not a lot of trees in grasslands, mm -hmm. because for most of our grasses, they really just don't necessarily like that. Yeah, they need sun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe looking at some other types of ground covers might be a really mm -hmm. good suggestion. So Dan, sorry, that may not be really the exact <laughs> answer you wanted, but sometimes <laughs> we just have to realize that that's just one of those things. So hopefully that helps you. And on line four, uh, we have Dave from Taylorville. You have a question about uh, clematis or clematis, depending on how you want to say it. Yes, I was wondering, do I take off the old growth, the old brown growth, you know, like it's still there this winter? Oh, sure. Or is it best to leave it on there so the clematis can climb it? Oh. I have trouble getting them to climb enough. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, pruning? I'm I tend to wait. Um, wait and see what comes back. Exactly. See you what. Know. See how far it greens up. Yeah. And then I'll kind of clear out the dead uh, from there. It's usually kind of what I, what I do because you never know how far back it got killed in the winter. It seems like. Um, so that is one of those things, and I and I and I totally agree with you. Sometimes it is hard because they don't really always wrap themselves yeah. around things and climb. So sometimes it, it does seem like it's easier if you leave the dead stuff on there, but it's just not as pretty. Because, yeah. Um, so you might think about a different type of trellis too, um, or maybe some string. Uh, even if you have a trellis, add some extra string to it, something that they can climb up a little bit yeah. more. Yeah. So that's so that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. I know sometimes people actually use like fishing line or mm -hmm. something like that, that too, to try yeah. to help them, you know, actually go up. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so good question. So at least you can you can wait on that particular thing. Is actually waiting on your on pruning or clematis or clematis, depending on how you want to say it. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to our second round of uh, emails as well as yeah. show and tell. And Kent, I think you have okay. something beautiful for yes. us here. Yes, uh, tonight we brought in some of our one of our varieties of willows. It's called Purple Heirloom, which is a mini catkin uh, on a blonde kind of colored bark. It has a little bit of a purple hue compared to the larger catkins uh, that you might see on pussy willows. Um, this one we prune annually. Uh, you're usually going to get anywhere from six to ten foot of new growth each year. Wow. Uh, <laughs> we, we prune them to get uh, more stems each year and uh, this one particular variety of our pussy willows starts to break bud usually about right after Christmas, first of New Year's. It's a really early one. Wow. So That's we've had this one around for a couple months now, and um, it's a very lovely uh, landscape plant also. It has a very lar large, long leaf, but it's very narrow, and it's more of just straight light green. And um, you also see a lot of uh, bees, well, stems that we don't cut, cut for the pollinators in the spring when it's I, in I've been the really month surprised. Of May. I've been surprised too with willows. That is some, yeah. I think it's that time period, sometimes yeah. where there isn't a whole lot of stuff, a lot of pollen. They're one of the, the, the go most to the willows that do uh, bloom. They'll, they'll have a nice. Uh, they'll be good for pollinators. You okay. know, whether it's butterflies early or bees. Yeah, that's that's interesting because yeah. we usually don't think about those for no, pollinators, we don't. do we? Oh, so good, so can so a multi-use plant. I yes, like it is. Okay. <laughs> so and Candace, very pretty. So my next question is about microgreens. Um, this person's saying that during the winter months she enjoys growing microgreens, and she'd love to hear some different methods uh, and ideas from us about how to how to grow them. Um, so for those of you who've never grown microgreens, essentially you're, you're planting kind of a, a layer of, of seeds and you're just growing them until that first set of, of two true leaves. Um, and then you cut them and you use them in salads and eat them fresh. So um, that's fairly easy to do. The, the times I've tried it, I've actually just reused um, like plastic trays from fruit at the grocery store, kind of clamshells, or even just use seed flats. <clears throat> Um, you fill that with potting mix, you pick out your seed mix that you want to use for microgreens, and then you cut them at whatever stage they're ready. 
Um, so I've really just kind of experimented with different types of containers to do it in. Uh, really the key is that they have enough light um, and you grow them to the right stage and cut them. Has anybody ever tried any other methods of... Yeah. I think light's the big thing. Yeah, I, I, think, I usually, I've yeah. always had some kind of supplemental light. Yeah. You know, trying to do it on the windowsill is yeah. like, mm, not Yeah, the best. and that's yeah. the difference too between a microgreen and a sprout. A sprout, you you don't need light for. You mm -hmm. actually grow those in the dark and you eat actual, the, the sprouted seed. Microgreen, you let grow a little bit longer. So you need that light to, to get those to grow. Okay. I, I like microgreens because they aren't around long enough to really have a lot of problems. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you, cut, you cut them early, you, you don't have to them. worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> then you're done. Okay, yeah. good, good. A fun thing and a good thing to get, get you through the winter mm -hmm. time. So. so Mike, what do you have? I've got an unusual question. Actually, not really unusual, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> uh, so I got an uh, uh, email from Lisa that says, My sweet gum tree produces really spiky seed pods that get everywhere. I have tried using them on... Uh, to line the bottom of my large container to help with drainage. That's a very good idea. But what else can I do with sweet gum balls? So I thought to myself, well, I've got some ideas, but <laughs> let me go online just to see if I can find out uh, other things with sweet gum balls. And did I find a potpourri <laughs> of images of sweet gum balls? There were, for the craft people, there were every kind of animal I could think of. Giraffes, chicks, bunnies, so squirrels. So you're making things out of them? They're little saying? building blocks. These little oh. sweet gum balls <laughs> are just like Legos and they, they have oh. little spikes and they're putting them together in all kinds of shapes and they're painting them. There were Christmas wreaths. I saw the Olympic circles. Hedgehog uh, would be good. Mm -hmm. Just all kinds of animals. I, I bet you that uh, uh, enterprising young man could make a battleship <laughs> and a hot rod <laughs> out of them. And in fact, I'd like to challenge the audience maybe to send some pictures in oh, of what like you that. could do with sweet gum balls <laughs> uh, because that could be quite fun. Now, what I would do and what I've done with sweet gum balls in the past is I use them for mulch. That's the easiest thing to do because you're raking them into a pile and if you have an area where you have woody mulch, uh, they make uh, a pretty good mulch and especially if you have mulching mowers with baggers on them, um, you can really chop this stuff up and use it as a mulch under your woodies. So I, I think mulch is a good idea as Supposedly well. Supposedly they keep away rabbits and stuff, have you? When they're spiky, I would imagine they do. Now mm -hmm. when they when they know. age, they get a little soft. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And do they germinate much? You know, like a, like a maple seedling, do you see a lot no, of? Um, no, no, yeah, I have not That would be good that. then, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Good. And we do have some lines open, so why don't you give us a call at 217-333-3495, and we'd be glad to help you out with your gardening questions. And I know it is one of those things that, you know, this time of year, I, are you guys excited about certain plant that maybe you're thinking about growing this next year or this growing season or something that you can't wait to try? Yeah. Uh, we're doing some different varieties of dahlias. This oh, dahlias, year. sure. And uh, we're doing some uh, newer varieties of lisianthus. Oh, okay. So we're pretty excited about that. They're very popular uh, at the markets and florists enjoy using them. So. Okay. Okay. Those are fun. Yeah. Those are fun. And mine's kind of similar. I'm going to ex expand my cut flower garden a little bit and try some new stuff out there. So. So do you do any there. perennials? I do some. And I, cutting gardens? And I tend to intermix it with the rest. Honestly, my whole landscape is cutting anything. I mean, <laughs> because you like to do Unless it. I, if I can't cut it and use it for something, I'm kind of like, well, what's the point of <laughs> having it in there? So, yeah, so my perennials are just kind of all intermix into the landscape. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we're going to give us some ideas about what you did on the, besides the, what you, one of the questions you had on the podcast. I, you said something about walnut and sandboxes. Yeah, walnuts you and confused sandboxes, me a little okay. bit, so I wasn't sure. I hadn't, I haven't listened to it well, yet, I don't but I was a little bit away, confusing. But we, really, the question was, what, I've tried all these plants under my walnut tree. What can oh, I grow under my really walnut tree? And, and I can't grow anything under there, so right now I have a sandbox, and is that a problem? Well, actually, oh. the, the, they didn't ask if that was a problem, but I pointed out it may be a kind of a chicken little thing, so. <laughs> um, but there are so many lists to choose from on tolerable plants mm -hmm. uh, for yeah. uh, walnut toxicity. Uh, it, most of the lists are based off observation. There's, I don't know if there's been any detailed studies done, but there's a lot of plants out there to try. Okay. Yeah. So I know, why don't you describe a little bit about, because people may not, if you're new to gardening, you may wonder like, what are you talking about, like walnut toxicity? So do you want to, somebody want to talk a little bit about what that, how you might 
how that might show up, or especially I'm thinking like on tomatoes, stuff like that. So how would how would you know that that's a problem? Sure. Well, I can explain what it is a little bit. Um, so black walnut puts off a, a respiration inhibitor. It's a chemical called juglone. Um, so as we're talking about, that juglone then gets into the soil. So any sensitive plant that grows in that area tends to, usually it starts with kind of chlorosis, the leaves yellow, the plant just looks stressed overall, uh, and usually eventually dies. Um, and the list of susceptible plants is equally as long as the, the list of, of not, <laughs> not <laughs> of tolerable plants. But for most gardeners, you tend to see it most with their vegetables, um, especially those in the solanaceous family. So tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, um, that's where people tend to see it first. Okay, it okay, like. good. So it's good to notice that those kinds of things. Yeah. Your plants aren't growing well. Look around. What trees are mm -hmm. around there? So, okay, good. Very good. Interesting. Okay. And on line two, we have Nancy from Champaign. And you have a question about, a, it looks like you're having some squirrel issues, Nancy. Well, I'm thinking that's what it is. I guess I'm looking for verification and maybe some help. I have some very tall, quite lovely, they were arborvitae. And the other day I looked out, and here's a pile of green laying at the bottom. Hmm. And I look up, and the tops of about three of them uh, are in varying stages of um, denudation, if you will. <laughs> and, and about three feet from the top down, it appears. And uh, clearly it's a chewed something. I mean, when I've looked, but I've never caught anything at it. And I don't know, short of getting a BB gun, maybe there isn't anything I can do anyway. Um, but I need some commentary about that. Okay, okay. So what do you think? So our Well, provider? I've seen squirrels nibble at branches, especially in the fall season when they're preparing their winter nests, and they'll nibble branches off and collect them and make nests. Um, that So it, it's possible that a squirrel's nibbling off your branches to collect and, uh, uh, and make a winter nest. Uh, I wonder though, uh, we have had some icing lately. Was this around any time with the a shrub or arborvitae was coated in ice? Could it have been that the, the weight of the ice or snow broke these branches off? Because that's possible if snow came down your roof um, and fell through the arborvitae possibly? Have they you thought? They nipped off. Oh, okay, so nipped yeah, so I, I would imagine it's a gnawing critter like <laughs> a squirrel. They're and how, how far off the ground is the oh, it's way at the top. These are probably uh, 10 to 12 feet tall. Okay, then yeah. And it the makes top. more sense. Either a squirrel or an Henri neighbor. Do you have an <laughs> Henri neighbors? <laughs> or a very big rabbit. <laughs> okay. I don't think so, but very I might tall have deer. one if I get a BB gun. Oh, oh, yeah, we're talking about that. Yeah. To keep squirrels out of trees, that is not easy. Um, yeah. If they can get up anything, they can jump over to your tree, but um, you can, to keep squirrels, the same way you keep squirrels off bird feeders, is you can wrap the trunk in something slick that they can't climb, um, like stovepipe or some kind of aluminum sheeting. It mm -hmm. doesn't look very good, yeah. but... Uh, About repellents or something like that? I haven't had much Let's luck with, with the... repellents. Yeah. And uh, I've greased poles, that wears down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> They're very tricky. I mean, I know. Mm -hmm. so but it all. It, so if she has had this damage, more than likely it's gonna, you know, it's gonna re grow out. Grow out, yeah, out of it. They may look again. funny for a while, so mm -hmm. that might be part of it. Okay. Okay. Hope that helps. And on uh, line four, we have Leonard from Camden, and you have about growing. Looks like uh, some raspberries. About growing those together, Leonard. Yes, um, I have a patch of red raspberries, and my neighbor says, "Oh, she really likes black raspberries." And I wondered if I could plant some black raspberries in uh, alongside or um, at one end uh, of the red raspberries, or would that make any difference? Growing them together? No, I mean yes. you, you might get some cross pollination happening and end up with some purples some <laughs> <laughs> somewhere. But I, other than that, I don't see any reason. I, I not? That sounds like an efficient use of space, yeah. Leonard. So go for it. And on line three, we have Dwight from Danville, and it sounds like we got some uh, strawberries. You think about planting some, Dwight, or? Uh, yes. Uh, just in the last couple seasons, my strawberries have been really tiny. I'm just kind of curious how long they last, and do you need to replant after so many years? Okay. So, quick thoughts on strawberries? 
Well, if you look at, thinking back to our Master Gardener manual, if you look at what's actually listed for a strawberry plant, the life of it is actually like a year for like the true heavy production of it. So it probably would be a good idea to kind of renovate, get rid of some of those older plants, let some of the new daughter plants kind of take over. Um, I would also think about too, maybe getting a soil test, seeing what your soil fertility is like, because they may need fertilized at this point if they've been in the same spot for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, just think about some renovations. Sometimes yeah. that's a good thing, especially when they start getting smaller. So so hopefully that gives you some ideas. And, you know, I, I know I am looking forward to this uh, coming season. And hopefully, as you have questions about gardening, you know, the good thing is that there's lots of ways you can connect with us. You can certainly use our new uh, voicemail as well, at, which is 217-300-8224. Voicemail us. You can also go on our Facebook page and leave us a question on there. And we'll be glad to help you out as we can. And check out the podcast. I think you will definitely enjoy this. Lots of ways to connect, and we'll look forward to talking to you again next week on Mid-American Gardener. Have a great week.